Right. So yeah. So today I'm really happy to kind of share a little bit about uh, a bit of research that I've been um, quite engrossed on for the last uh, two years. Uh, and the main kind of uh, topic of this uh, bit of uh, of this study was to really kind of look at the importance of um, uh, frugivores in really maintaining um, the, the diversity of uh, fleshy fruited uh, plant species uh, worldwide, right? So to start off, you know, you know, seed dispersal is a very kind of important part of the life history of plants, right? Like as sessile kind of organisms, you know, they have to learn how to leverage uh, and exploit resources um, within, you know, the, the place that they grow and the place that they eventually die, right? Um, and so seed dispersal becomes a very important mechanism by which plants can colonize, uh, you know, new sites, you know, uh, uh, favorable new sites to kind of recruit and then hopefully mature and then um, become reproductive at, at some point. Um, it's also, you know, one of the important mechanisms to reduce mortality from various, you know, from competition with the parent plant or other density dependent factors such as, you know, natural enemies or, um, uh, or such as a uh, fungi or, or seed predators and so on. And so given this context, seed dispersal is one of the most important processes organizing plant communities and, and, and ecosystems. Uh, and it will not, and you know, angiosperms have kind of realized this, that seed dispersal is very important. And as such, you know, many plants have evolved, you know, fruits and seeds uh, to kind of entice animals of all sorts uh, to provide uh, an inadvertent kind of seed dispersal kind of service. So this may come in the form of a nutritional reward, such as a sugar or protein rich fleshy tissue kind of follow, uh, surrounding the seed or within the pulp of a fruit. Um, and as well as various ways of advertising such, such a reward, such as through scent or through sight. Uh, in, tropical, in, you know, in tropical ecosystems, between 70 to 90% of all woody species are animal dispersed, which is really a stunning kind of testament to how important this is. It's almost like if you don't do it, you will lose out in some way, unless you don't have uh, a, a, another kind of advantage. And a variety of different groups of organisms are known to be seed dispersers from mammals, birds, um, but perhaps less, uh, less in the public kind of eye. Um, some insects and even some fish have been um, documented to, to, to disperse seeds. One of the interesting things about uh, seed dispersal and frugivory interactions is that unlike other plant animal interactions like pollination where co-evolution can give rise to very, very tight mutualistic interactions. Frugivorous interactions are among the least specialized of ecological interactions. So if you think about, you know, like the diversity of fruit that a human eats, right? We eat anything from, you know, peaches with a very hard stone in the middle to, uh, to grapes, to, you know, to, to watermelons, which is a, a technically a kind of berry with very small seeds. So we eat a huge variety. So, um, and in, in nature, you know, these interactions are mediated, you know, by um, characteristics of the fruit or the seed and as well as the disperser. But in general, you know, one general rule is if you can fit it in your mouth, you would probably eat it. Um, whether or not you will disperse the seeds or not effectively is another kind of question. But one of the very big, uh, un, you know, like uh, one of the big questions is, you know, given that these kind of traits uh, govern these interactions, like how does that kind of uh, uh, shape, you know, larger scale um, kind of patterns in biodiversity. You know, one major consequence of the relationship between, you know, how big a frugivore is and how big a seed that it can move is that, you know, large fruit, uh, large megafauna such as elephants and tapirs and bears and so on are incredibly important for the dispersal of certain kinds of fruit. So given their large guts, you know, longer gut retention times and uh, longer day ranges, um, you know, larger animals and birds as well uh, will be able to just transport large numbers of seeds over longer distances than smaller uh, kind of mammals and maintaining potentially disconnected habitats that may be separated by, uh, you know, a, a, a large distance. So in an agent-based simulation by uh, Machias Perez, uh, uh, the author of this paper that I'm showing a figure on the right, 
you know, they did some simulations of animal movements and also kind of simulated uh, the probability of pooping <laughs> given a certain dispersal distance. Um, they found that the median sea dispersal distance of an elephant may be up to 1.5 kilometers, whereas a, whereas a small sea dispersal like a wild boar may disperse only a fraction of that distance, like only a few hundred, few hundred meters. As animals are crucial players in the ecosystems, you know, their loss may trigger a whole cascade of effects on the functioning and diversity of ecosystems. One of the most pernicious threats that natural ecosystems face is deformation, a term that we kind of use to, uh, to refer to the decline, extirpation, or complete extinction of animal populations. And the scale of deformation is both widespread and drastic. Uh, in a recent uh, kind of Living Planet report, which is a collaboration between the World Wildlife Fund for Nature and the Zoological Society of London, where they've looked at time series data for various vertebrate populations worldwide. They estimate that, you know, uh, vertebrate populations have declined on average by about 60%. Um, however, you know, to put things into perspective, human beings have been causing deformation for a very long time. So uh, ever since humans have kind of emigrated from our ancestral populations in Africa several hundred, several hundred thousand years ago and migrated across the globe, we have also caused you know, widespread ecological disruption from hunting to habitat modification and so on. And this is well documented in the fossil record. For example, the disappearance of many mammals in the fossil record appear to be consistent with uh, the, the, the dates of you know, arrival of uh, humans to those particular continents. Um, extinctions tend to be proportionally lowest in areas where Homo sapiens originated, but uh, you know, are particularly high in areas where Homo sapiens may have arrived last in geologic time, for example, in um, South America and in Australia. So this historical context is uh, quite interesting because it provides us a natural experiment to look at how uh, plants that rely on animal disposal, especially of these megafauna, uh, may have responded to, you know, their loss, to their disappearance. So one of the most characteristic things is that, you know, these mammal extinctions are not random, they show a size dependent pattern. And because uh, this is in part because large body animals are more threatened and more vulnerable to um, hunting and habitat loss and other anthropogenic pressures. The result is that mammal communities are not just getting smaller than they were thousands of years ago, but they continue to become smaller through time, right? Um, however, it remains unclear like how um, this continual downsizing of animal communities will affect kind of ecosystem processes through time. So one way in which we can look at this is to, 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 to leverage the past to kind of understand what the future holds, right? We can understand how ecosystems respond to the loss of past megafauna to really look at uh, to, to maybe get a sense of how ecosystems will be shaped by, you know, the deformation that we are imposing on natural ecosystems today. So to do this, I focus on palms. Uh, uh, it's an iconic group of fleshy fruited tropical plants, you know, like even the, the, the least trained botanist should be able to tell apart a palm from all the other plants up there. Um, they're highly diverse. There's about, you know, 2,500 species worldwide. And they are predominantly uh, animal dispersed. They're almost completely animal dispersed with only a few kind of exceptions, which we know about, like the coconut and the, you know, the coco de mer, uh, and, and so on. And they're keystone fruit resources in many tropical and subtropical areas, particularly in the neotropics, right? So um, this is in part due to their tendency for continuous flowering and fruiting, which makes them keystone fruit resources. And they also display an enormous range in fruit size, shape, color, and are dispersed by animals over a huge range of sizes, right? So um, the boresoids of Africa can be up to like 20 centimeters in size, um, but you know, many palm fruits are you know, no bigger than a centimeter in length, for example. So I first kind of looked at you know, the geographic patterns of fruit size globally. So to do this, I uh, uh, looked at the world checklist of palms which is uh, basically a bunch of regional checklists at the more or less the country scale. Um, and then I looked at, you know, the, the kind of like the, the, the fruit sizes of those palms in those countries. So I, to do this, I did the palm traits database, which has fruit size data for about 8% of all species worldwide. And then we filled in the gaps by taking uh, the uh, genus level means for species that didn't have information for. 
this data comes from a variety of um, different sources, from taxonomic monographs to herbarium specimens to scientific articles and so on. And has been digitized in a in a very nice uh, uh, structure. And then to evaluate the impacts of past deformation, I focus specifically on mammal frugivores um, uh, for several reasons. Number one, they're highly important seed dispersers, including of palms. They disperse palm seeds over, uh, you know, across a wide range of sizes from the very largest to the very smallest. And they have a very good Pleistocene fossil record, which allows us to reconstruct what past frugivore assemblages would may have looked like. So I apologize for the, the scale. I mean, it's impossible to kind of put these kind of mammals uh, in, in the right kind of scale relative to each other. Um, so I define two faunistic scenarios. One is the current, which only includes extant species and their present day distribution. And the present natural scenario, which considers extant species and also mammal species that we think were present during the last interglacial, so about 130,000 years ago. Um, so the last time there wasn't an ice age, essentially. Um, as well as their distributions from, uh, from paleontological evidence. And then I generated data on the body size of these frugivore assemblages for both these scenarios. But this was not, uh, this was not a trivial task as frugivory tends not to be strongly associated with particular morphological adaptations. And so any information from the fossil record is necessarily indirect, right? So if you look at the, if you look at an African elephant, and you look at this dentition, it it would you would tell you know from its very big grinding molars that it's it's a grazing kind of animal, but African elephants have a huge amount of fruit in their diet, given that kind of dentition. So what so to to kind of classify these extinct mammals into whether or not they were frugivore or not, I had to rely on several different sources. One, I looked at the diets of modern day relatives. I looked into things like it's you know like this dentition, uh, evidence of coprolites, and also it's, uh, you know, stable isotope composition of uh, whatever fossils that, uh, uh, whether there's any information on the stable isotope signatures of any of these um, creatures. Um, here, I assume that in the absence of all other information that browsers or mixed feeders were more likely to be frugivores than grazers, but I make exceptions um, where, you know, like the modern grazing groups were highly frugivorous, for example, like the elephants. Um, there is some caveats to this, which I had to kind of make some ad hoc kind of uh, 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 I, had, I, had to, I had to apply some kind of discretion to. For example, uh, one could see that you know in South America there existed these humongous kind of mega sloths, like humongous sloth-like creatures that would have weighed the size of an African elephant. Um, but their modern-day relatives are these very small arboreal almost 100% folivorous uh, uh, little tiny sloths. And it's very unlikely that like that, you know, that enormous sloth would have had the same diet, right? As, as this very tiny uh, arboreal sloths that we have today. So I had to kind of make um, some determinations uh, based, on the, based on other information like that. So one of the things that we realized is that uh, is that many Pleistocene megafauna effects are enormous geographic ranges. And so they kind of influence, um, so to say, biogeography or uh, the evolutionary or ecological dynamics of ecosystems over a wide, uh, wide area. So make, uh, when we looked at the maximum body size of uh, mammal frugivore assemblages, they have declined by about 11 fold from an average of 600 kilograms to about 52 kilograms. And in the neotropics, this is particularly uh, this is particularly drastic. So, um, whereas in the last interglacial there were eleven frugivore predated frugivorous taxa that were over a ton in weight, you know now the largest frugivores are tapirs, which are only you know a few hundred kilograms. So there there, there has been there there are some um, asymmetries in how the megafaunal extinctions that were um, supposedly caused by either climate change or in a combination of climate change and human uh, hunting, uh, there are, you know, there are definitely huge disparities across the different uh, biogeographic regions in that sense. One thing that we found was, so one of the most interesting things that we found was that there was actually a very strong correlation between the size of the largest frugivores in the region 
and the size of the largest palm fruits in the region. Um, and this, was, this, this uh, relationship was fairly strong even when you accounted for um, frugivores that went extinct in the past 100, 130,000 years. Um, so this suggests that you know, even though uh, 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 there is trade matching at a very local scale, right? Like big frugivores eat big fruits, but at, at the very, very larger scale, this is also true. Areas with big fruits will also tend to, be, to have the big uh, uh, frugivores as well, right? So if effectively the biogeography and, the, and the, the, the continued persistence of these megafauna fruits is completely dependent upon the presence of these large frugivores, which makes complete sense. Um, this is not the case for the Afrotropics where palm fruit sizes were the largest um, in the world. And also they have the largest kind of uh, megafaunal uh, mammals, frugivores, um, but this might be because of um, climatic factors uh, might be a more important kind of uh, explainer of fruit size patterns on that continent. So then the next thing that we looked at was to what extent does the body size of either the present day versus the past explain modern day patterns in fruit size. To do this, we kind of analyze the variance explain, you know, uh, we, we use the model averaging framework where we analyze the variance explained by current versus present day, present natural frugible assemblages. And what we found was that uh, current fruit size much better explained uh, by present day frugible assemblages than those uh, in the past, right? As you can see from the bars here, um, the yellow bars are always higher than the, than the blue bars in terms of uh, the variance explained which suggests that there has been a lot of uh, ecological and evolutionary reorganization of these palm communities over tens of thousands of years since these megafauna went extinct. But in the neotropics, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, where the megafauna extinctions were the most severe, uh, variation in fruit sizes was equally well explained by the past frugivores, um, which, which was quite an interesting kind of pattern that we found. And I will try to kind of explain that in the next few slides. So, one of the things that happens when you have, uh, one of the immediate things that happens when you lose kind of like your main seed disperser is probably, you know, a reduction in the recruitment, right? And this, if, uh, if debilitating enough and sustained enough um, may lead to the potential extinction of many of these large fruit of palms. Um, however, you know, uh, it has been documented by some other um, seed dispersal ecologists that, you know, some capacity for um, uh, adaptation may exist. So for example, in this study by Mauro Galetti and colleagues in 2013 in science showed that there has been very rapid uh, evolution on the order of uh, one millimeter um, uh, over the past 200 years towards much smaller seed sizes uh, as you know, larger bird species such as toucans and toucanets are removed from, from, you know, from, from forests. Um, due to you know habitat loss and, and hunting and so on. However, you know the loss of seed dispersal may also be compensated by remaining frugivores. So one of the great mysteries in the neotropics is that there are many of these large fruited palm species that you know ecologists have always wondered why they exist. Right? They seem to be much larger than a tapir can handle. Um, most of the fruit crop just ends up at the bottom of the ends up at the bottom of the plant uneaten and just predated by beetles. And some of these uh, uh, ecologists, including you know, the, uh, Dan Jensen, you know, hypothesized that maybe some of these past megafauna might have uh, had a role in, in dispersing these, uh, in these seeds back when they still existed. But now you know, they are, you know, their ecological anachronisms was the term that he's, they're kind of out of place. But it turns out that not only that they are not only out of place, they are still being sustained, their populations are still being sustained by the actions of um, whatever is left in the ecosystems. So it turns out that many of these large um, fruited palm seeds are being dispersed by scatter hoarding rodents like agoutis. Um, and there was a very interesting study in 2012 where they radio tagged a bunch of seeds and looked at how much they kind of move from the action of these rodents in the understory uh, found that 35% of these supposedly megafauna palm seeds will move up to 100 meters. And in one instance, one seed was cached and moved up to 36 times. 
So either, you know, maybe the goodies have a lot of jealous neighbors that are just stealing their, stealing their catch or, you know, very paranoid individuals that just keep digging it up and then keeping it somewhere else to prevent uh, it from being stolen. But it goes to show that, you know, it's a very context specific kind of thing, you know, just because you lose your main disperser, you know, there might be some capacity for the system to compensate or, or for the ecological networks to rewire in some case. So the next question that I wanted to ask was, you know, like, can we kind of predict uh, areas in the future where we expect deformation impact to be highest for palm assemblages using the same principle? If if areas with largest uh, if areas with uh, uh, largest fruit also have the largest frugivores, and if those largest frugivores are the most uh, kind of threatened, then one might say that you know those areas are. Uh, may be uh, more heavily impacted by their loss, for example. So to do this, um, I first kind of looked at changes in IUCN red list status among mammals. So for example, you know, uh, for, many, for many vertebrates, uh, their conservation status has been uh, evaluated fairly regularly. So for example, the Malay tapir was listed as vulnerable in 1996. And you know it's now listed as endangered uh, and was listed as endangered in 2008, whereas the Asian elephant is always stuck in the same uh, uh, in the same category, adjusted for inflation because of course like IUCN categories also uh, kind of change through time. And to do this, I kind of use like a data set that has been compiled by two different groups. One that looked at the changes in IUCN status for ungulates and carnivores between 1975 and 2008. And another one where, that looked at uh, changes in IUCN status for all mammals over a smaller time period of 12 years from 1996 to, uh, is that tw yeah, 12 years between uh, 1996 and 2008. And then I kind of developed the model, which is a, a continuous time Markov chain model um, to kind of estimate rates of transition between these rate list categories. So, this is not for those people who are, you know, who have any understanding of uh, uh, how uh, mutations in DNA sequences are modeled. This is it is basically the same model, except using, except having A, Ts, and Gs and Cs. I would have these different categories, like least concern, near threatened, and all these different conservation statuses. And then I created a model that allowed for um, transitions between each of these uh, uh, of these categories. Um, that are adjacent to each other. And then I fitted this to those two data sets in, in that, that I mentioned, and I got some estimate of extinction probability for each of the, the, the IUCN realist categories. So for example, a least concerned species uh, uh, would have a 0.1% probability of going extinct over the next 100 years, whereas uh, a critically endangered species would have a one in five chance of going extinct in the next 100 years. So in some sense, these extinction probabilities are based on real rates, right? They're based on um, data on, you know, the number of species that actually do transition towards, uh, uh, towards extinction um, in, in the literature. Um, one thing to note is that these are time homogeneous rates. So I'm assuming that the rates that are measured from, you know, the mid seventies to the, you know, to the to the early noughties, the thousands, two thousands, um, are kind of um, uh, uh, you know where the baseline extinction probabilities are the same, right? But it's entirely possible that you know things are going worse for natural populations, and so um, these extinction probabilities could be seen as somewhat conservative in some sense. Next up, I kind of relied on the the fruit size and body size kind of relationship. And then, I, uh, and then I simulated based on those extinction probabilities, what the remaining mammal communities will look like in terms of the, you know, the body size. And so one can imagine something that looks like this, where you know, I have a deformated future and that difference um, I then use as an estimate of deformation impact. So areas where the body mass has lost, uh, where you know, the body size of, of, of uh, mammal frugivores has dropped a lot, you know, is more like uh, will have a higher value in terms of deformation impact in areas where uh, body size has not changed very much in my simulations. 
so what I ended up was something that looked like that, right? That the the that there is high deformation impact in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Like after we've done this simulation, you know, a hundred times using those uh, extinction probabilities that we estimated from those two data sets. Um, and it turned out to be about a 4% decrease in fruit size is necessary to maintain this fruit frugivore relationship. Um, on average, uh, across the world, this is about a 0.2 centimeter. Um, this will correspond to about a 0.2 centimeter change in fruit size, which doesn't seem like a lot. But when you look at the median size of a, of a palm fruit worldwide, which is about 1.2 centimeters, that's actually quite a huge amount for uh, many, uh, many of these palms to uh, accommodate, right? Of course, you know, species specific, uh, uh, different species may, may um, uh, will, uh, will have a disproportionate um, vulnerability to this, this uh, to this deformation impact. So, which I will kind of go through in the next few slides. So one of the big problems is that many of these megafauna dependent fruit, are, you know, are dependent on these large mammals, right? So the African elephant is capable of dispersing seeds of, let's say, um, Phoenix, which is, you know, the date palm, some of which are only about a centimeter big. But they are also capable of, uh, of uh, dispersing seeds from Barassus, which is up to about 12 to 20 centimeters. However, you know, for many of the seeds at the smaller size, uh, towards the smaller size of the spectrum, um, you know, they're more likely to have uh, substitute seed dispersers. And so if they lose some of these megafauna, you know, they might still be able to persist with whatever is left behind, right? Um, and so given this logic, you know, larger, you know, it's my opinion that you know large fruits are likely to be at a higher risk of extinction given their tighter dependence on these large kind of mammals. And so you know, how will deformation impact plant communities? Really, I mean, like this is a macroecological kind of study, and so you know everything should be taken with a pinch of salt, right? Like this, these are just back of the envelope calculations that do not necessarily um, translate to something quantifiable uh, at, the, at the species population level, for example, right? And I think the study that, uh, that this study actually shows that it really depends, right? Like deformation will have a very huge uh, immediate impact on certain plant populations, in, including possible extinction for many of these megafauna dependent plants. However, as we've seen from the neotropics, you know, like other, whether or not, you know, uh, a, a species slowly declines in their extinction or not is also dependent on, you know, how the ecological networks are kind of structured in that system. So in that system that happened, uh, the activity of agudis, for example, was able to compensate for the loss of, uh, um, for, the la for the loss of the neotropical megafauna um, in dispersing the seeds, right? Um, it's also important to note that size is not the only factor in fruit frugivore interactions, uh, and nor is it the only dimension of deformation. So deformation does not necessarily, is not, you know, we only remove the top few and all that's left, uh, you know, small ones, right? Deformation, um, uh, given the fact that, you know, frugivore interactions are so multifaceted, right? So a megafauna, a, a small frugivore may also be um, highly crucial for certain tree populations, um, even if those tree populations uh, are, have small seeds, for example. Um, and also there's indirect cascading effects. So it's not just deformation of the seed dispersers, you're also deformating, you know, many of the large carnivores, medium-sized carnivores, and those may serve to regulate um, stuff like seed predators, for example. So one may find that in a very deformated forest, that you know, seed rotation rates go up, even if seed dispersal doesn't change uh, at all, right? And that might have uh, unintended um, uh, negative uh, consequence on population dynamics in any given area. Um, so I think what's really missing here is that you know the long-term consequences of deformation on the diversity and composition of tropical forests is really still an open question. So I point everybody to this um, figure from Red Harrison, who published this paper that's based on the uh, the, the, the CTFS plot, the forest geo plot in Lambia and Sarawak, 
where they've kind of tracked the, uh, instead of looking at, you know, the, the seeds, they've kind of looked at the saplings. So things that uh, are big enough to be censored, uh, to, to be counted in their censuses. And what they found was that uh, um, fleshy fruited plant species that have larger seeds were becoming more and more aggregated through time, as opposed to smaller uh, ones. Uh, smaller seeds that were animal dispersed, which suggested that, you know, maybe there, uh, oh, I forgot to mention that Lambia is also a very defaunated uh, kind of forest that has supposedly lost many of its largest frugivores, such as hornbills and, uh, and tapirs and so on. And so it looks like there is already starting to be some kind of slow signature on um, how seed dispersal is operating in, in such a landscape. It looks like it's becoming more and more limited and uh, but they do not detect any changes in the mortality of these species, which um, might be uh, an issue with, you know, the, the length of observation that, that we have with these censuses. Perhaps it takes, you know, a much longer time for these, um, for deformation to truly manifest itself. So one of the things that really, that I've been thinking about uh, following this study is that, can we think of ecosystems like, you know, uh, like this, right? Like basically, if you can imagine this landscape where you have little peaks and little troughs and troughs are where, you know, ecosystems will tend to kind of gravitate towards. So um, like if a system kind of left on its own, they will tend to gravitate towards these little pockets of probability. So think of them as like areas by which uh, an ecosystem will uh, gravitate towards given the prevailing um, uh, biological kind of regime, like the kinds of this kind of animals that are in there and the kinds of uh, organisms that live in the forest, for example. And maybe, you know, over, over, over decades, you might have a little bit of uh, this little ball, which represents your ecosystem might jiggle around a little bit because, you know, maybe one year it was bad for this particular tree and for this particular tree species and other years, you know, it was bad for a particular disperser. But in general, you know, over long time periods, all of these kind of effects kind of kind of even out, right? Like maybe the tree kind of recovers over time. Um, or maybe there's another, comp there's compensation in another part of the system that pulls it back into that little kind of uh, 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 basin that, that we see. So we can think of the system as having some degree of ecological inertia, right? It, it, it takes a lot to go wrong before it moves from one state to another state. In this case, from a more biodiverse state with a lot of fleshy fruited plant species in the system versus a less biodiverse state with very few fleshy fruited plant species in the system. But we can also use this analogy to kind of see, uh, to kind of uh, think about how deformation might be affecting ecosystems. Like is, is deformation affecting the ability for ecosystems to kind of return to a new normal? Um, is it affecting its ability to, um, you know, and if that's the case, you know, like, um, it's possible that our systems are kind of moving towards a new normal without us even knowing it. And I think it's very crucial that we kind of figure out what that new normal may look like and how we can um, enhance the resilience of natural ecosystems to kind of stay in a more desirable state in terms of biodiversity or ecosystem functioning and so on. So I think I will kind of leave everybody with kind of one of my favorite quotes um, growing up as, as a young ecologist. And it was kind of by Kent Redford where he says, you know, we must not let a forest full of trees fool us into thinking all is well, right? Like, I mean, he's, he's a little bit um, exaggerating by saying that forests empty, right? Forests are never truly empty. Uh, even if you lose some of your biggest uh, megafauna, you still have, you know, the most resilient species still kind of remain. But the idea is that, you know, um, in these faunistically impoverished systems, uh, one may expect them to slowly change over decades, centuries to come, right? And I think there is really a need for new approaches to that are able to predict this ecosystem change or biodiversity loss over long time scales, and whether or not our systems uh, are able to, uh, to 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 buffer that 
for example, and how we can uh, implement management strategies that can help systems stay in a very kind of biodiverse state as opposed to a, a less biodiverse state. I also think it's kind of impractical to save all biodiversity and preserve ecosystems indefinitely. I think that it would be unlikely that, you know, um, for example, in, in Europe, there's debate about, uh, and also in the neotropics actually, um, there's debate about, you know, reintroducing certain frugibles or reintroducing certain key elements in the ecosystem um, in an effort to kind of restore them um, to, its, to its natural state, you know. Um, but I think in the tropics, you know, especially in Singapore, I, I'm pretty sure that we will not want to kind of release tigers back in the Bukit Timah um, to kind of keep the wild boars in check, right? So if that were the case, you know, like what can we, uh, can, can we come up with several scenarios for how we want our ecosystems of the future to look like? And can we kind of steer them towards some favorable uh, kind of outcomes in that sense? And lastly, I would like to say that, you know, restoring or preserving ecosystem functions is probably one of the most cost-effective ways to ensure that, you know, ecosystems continue to be rich and self-sustaining. Um, we think about primary forests are slowly kind of eroding through de deformation and the loss of some of these large sea dispersers. But equally, you know, there is enormous potential in secondary forests, previously degraded land and deformation might have an impact on, you know, whether or not this land actually uh, can restore itself to its former glory effectively. Um, so I think this is something that we should all be thinking about when we think about deformation. It's not just you know, oh no, you know, systems are going to be collapsing and, uh, and it's in a death spiral, but we should also think about whether or not there's enough components of the system, enough functions in the system that are left behind that um, the degraded systems can actually come back. And with that, you know, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Daniel Kisling, Jens Christian Svenning, and Soren Forby, and uh, NTU for helping to support, you know, part of this research. And with that, I would like to thank everyone and answer questions.